Welcome to the first in a series of videos entitled Don't Pull Back, Avoiding Stall and Spin Accidents. My name is John Shearing. I'm an FAA certified ground instructor. Today we will be using the X-Plane Flight Simulator to illustrate how a skidding turn can trick a pilot into pulling back on the control yoke to cause a stall and spin accident. Now a skidding turn can lead to a stall and spin, but it is never the final cause. An airplane can't spin unless it's stalled, and with the exceptions of wind shear and icing, there is one thing and one thing only that can cause an airplane to stall, pulling back on the yoke. Be it the pilot, be it the autopilot, or be it the trim tab, it is nearly impossible to stall and then spin an airplane unless one of these three are pulling back on the control yoke. Usually it's the pilot. Now licensed pilots are a very smart group of people and every licensed pilot knows that pulling back on the yoke is about the only way to stall and then spin an airplane. So how do so many pilots year after year get tricked into killing themselves by pulling back on the yoke? Well there are a lot of ways and throughout this series of video presentations we are going to try and uncover them all. I want you to be able to recognize situations and conditions that might make you pull back on the yoke against your better judgment. One of these is the skidding turn. So let's get started. Contrary to what you see in the movies, the elevator should not be used to control the altitude of your airplane. Let's see what happens when a typical Hollywood aviation sequence is played out in accordance with the law of physics. Let's see what really happens when pilots think that pulling back on the yoke will increase their altitude. Secret Agent 770, this is Mission Control. The safe zone is just a few miles ahead of you. James, why are we flying so low? Dr. Nasty has stolen some Stinger missiles. We need to stay underneath his radar. James, are we going to make it over that ridge? Yes, darling. I'll just pull back on the yoke to make the plane go up. But James, we're no longer going up. We seem to be slowing down instead. That's strange. I guess I need to pull back on the yoke some more. What's happening, James? The plane is falling. Every stall and spin accident is caused by pulling back on the yoke. You just witnessed this accident in its simplest form. The pilot actually believed that pulling back on the yoke would make his airplane go up. Most people in the general population believe this to be true. This misconception has killed thousands of pilots over the years. As we proceed, we shall see that the yoke elevator combination actually controls airspeed, that increasing power is what makes an airplane go up, and that when you can no longer increase power, you can no longer increase the rate at which an airplane can maintain a sustained climb. Pulling back on the yoke might make the airplane climb for a moment, but without extra power, this climb comes at the expense of airspeed. And if airspeed is allowed to fall below stall speed, the airplane will no longer fly. Let's watch this same scene again, but this time without the drama. Instead, we will watch it simultaneously from four different points of view. We will look at the airspeed indicator in the first view. Keep an eye on the green arc. When the needle moves past the low speed end, 50 knots for this airplane, stall will occur. Let's mark the current airspeed, 95 knots, with a green line. We're using the color green because green indicates a safe margin above stall speed. A second view will show us the control yoke. We're going to mark the yoke column with a green line also to show that extending the column to this particular length will cause the airplane to fly at exactly 95 knots by virtue of the fact that the yoke is holding the elevator in this particular position as shown in the next two views which we will also mark with green lines. Let's call this the 95 knot elevator position. The third view shows us the elevator from close up and from the side. The fourth view shows us the elevator from behind and also allows us to see what's happening to the airplane. In this scene, I want you to observe that the yoke controls the elevator position, that the elevator position controls the airspeed, and that when the airspeed falls below 50 knots, the airplane will stall. Here we go. The pilot wants to climb over the ridge, but he is already at full power, so a greater sustained rate of climb is impossible. He thinks that pulling back on the yoke will give him the altitude he needs, so he starts to haul back. The airplane is starting to climb as we can see on the altimeter, so he thinks he's doing the right thing. He doesn't understand that without extra power from the engine, he's paying for his greater rate of climb with airspeed. The elevator is now in the 50 knot position. If the pilot knew how airplanes worked, he would stop pulling back. 
but his plan seems to be working, so he is encouraged to pull back some more, and it's the last thing he ever does. Stall and spin occurs as his airspeed falls below 50. If all we ever did was fly straight with wings level, then airspeed would be a very good predictor of an oncoming stall. All we would need to do is keep the needle of the airspeed indicator away from the low speed end of the green arc. Here the plane is flying quite nicely with wings level at 60 knots. But in turning flight, your stall speed increases as your bank angle increases, so the end of the green arc on your airspeed indicator will no longer tell you when you are approaching stall speed. At a bank angle of 45 degrees, for instance, we see this airplane stall and spin at 65 knots, which is a perfectly safe speed in wings level flight and well within the green arc. I can't bear to watch, so we'll stop the action here. But before we leave this scene, take a look at the elevator. It's obvious that this pilot was pulling back on the yoke more than he should have been when flying at that particular bank angle. Or to say it another way, he was flying slower than he should have been when turning the aircraft at a 45 degree angle of bank. There is one predictor of stall, however, that never changes no matter how much you bank your wings, and that is angle of attack. Your wings will always stall at the same critical angle of attack no matter how much your wings are banked. Notice the elevator position in the plane below. The pilot is holding the control yoke forward. The plane is flying fast at a small angle of attack. There is no danger of stall. Now look at the plane above. You can see from the elevator position that the pilot is pulling the control yoke back. The airplane is flying slowly at a large angle of attack. This airplane is in danger of stall. So if you understand what the angle of attack is, then you will be well prepared to avoid stall and spin accidents in turning flight as well as straight flight with wings level. Let's get acquainted with the angle of attack in a familiar setting. We will watch the secret agent stall and spin scenario again, but this time we will make the flight path visible and we will make the air visible as well. The purple line is our flight path and the green lines are showing the air as it moves past the wings. This air shown in green is called the relative wind. It's the wind that the airplane seems to feel as the propeller pulls it through the air. It's not the prop wash. It's not the air being thrown back by the propeller, but rather the wind that the wings feel as they rush against the still air. You know this wind. It's the wind you feel when you stick your hand out the window of a moving car. The air isn't moving. The car is moving. But it feels like wind just the same. Well, this relative wind, which seems to move against your wings, is what makes the airplane fly. But in order for the wings to work, the airplane needs to be pointed into the wind. To say it another way, the airplane must be pointed along its flight path to within about 18 degrees in order to avoid a stall. This is what the elevator and the rudder are for. They are used to keep the airplane pointed along the flight path so the wings can receive the air they need from a direction that will allow the wings to work. Well, if you're going to point your airplane along its flight path so as to align your wings with the relative wind, then you will need to know where the flight path is, and it's not always easy to find. If it were, then no one would ever stall. In X-Plane, we can see the flight path. It's the purple line. But what about flying in the real world, where there is no purple line to guide you? How then can you tell if your airplane is aligned with its flight path? Well, the ball inclinometer tells you if you need to yaw the nose of your airplane right or left by use of rudder. This is called coordinating your flight path. And your airspeed tells you if you need to increase or decrease your angle of attack by use of the elevator. This pilot can't see his angle of attack directly, but he knows from his airspeed that his wings are just about to stall and that he needs to get the control yoke forward right away so as to reduce his angle of attack. The ailerons are the control surfaces which allow you to choose the shape of your flight path. Wings level makes a straight flight path and wings banked makes a circular flight path. In other words, the ailerons allow you to change direction. Please take note that the rudder does absolutely nothing to turn the airplane. Banking the wings makes the airplane turn. The only thing the rudder is used for in turning flight is to keep the airplane coordinated, which means to keep the nose and tail aligned with the circular flight path as the need is indicated by the ball inclinometer. This is a very important job, however, and key to preventing stall and spin accidents, as we shall see shortly. Any pilot who tries to turn an airplane by use of rudder alone 
or any pilot who tries to help the ailerons in a turn by using more rudder than is necessary to maintain coordination is forcing the nose and tail out of alignment with the flight path. This is called uncoordinated flight and it is a very dangerous condition when flying at low air speeds, or to say it more accurately, uncoordinated flight is a very dangerous condition when flying near the critical angle of attack because if the critical angle of attack is exceeded and the airplane stalls, then the airplane will also spin if it is uncoordinated at the time of stall. What you have just seen is the skidded turn. During a skid, the nose is on the inside of the turn and the tail is on the outside. It's a killer. It's a killer once because it will cause your airplane to spin in the event that your wings are stalled. This is what we have just seen, and it's a killer twice because the skidded turn can trick a pilot into pulling back on the control yoke, which will cause a stall and then spin if the critical angle of attack is exceeded. We are going to take a look at how this happens, but before we can have that conversation, we need to see how descending flight affects the angle of attack. Here our airplane is flying in a wings level position at 84 knots with a power setting of 2,250 RPM. We have chosen this particular airspeed and power combination because it is the only one that allows us to maintain a constant altitude, seen here on the altimeter and vertical speed indicator, while holding a pitch attitude of zero degrees with respect to the horizon, as seen on the attitude indicator and as shown from outside the airplane. This condition is an excellent starting point from which to observe how descent affects the angle of attack. An airplane which is flying at a constant altitude is following a flight path that extends toward the horizon, and an airplane which is maintaining a pitch attitude of zero degrees is pointing at the horizon. So this airplane is both moving toward the horizon and pointing at it as well. We see here that the relative wind, which moves toward the airplane from the opposite direction of our flight path, is meeting the cord line of the wings nearly head on, so we have a very small angle of attack. Now we will see what happens to the angle of attack if we continue to point the airplane at the horizon but fly towards the ground. Let's reduce power while holding the same pitch attitude of zero degrees. This is accomplished by pulling back on the control yoke as power is reduced. With reduced power the airplane can no longer hold altitude so now we have a descending flight path. The descending flight path produces an ascending relative wind so the relative wind is now striking the wing from below instead of nearly head on as it was before we started the descent. The result is an increased angle of attack as you can see here and the airspeed has decreased to mark this new angle of attack. If we were to pitch down to match the angle of descent we would again have a smaller safer angle of attack. There are three life-saving facts to remember from this demonstration. Fact 1. Pitch attitude is in no way a direct measure of your angle of attack. So don't think that you can look out the window or look at your attitude indicator and know how close you are to the critical angle of attack. Fact 2. In non-turning flight, your airspeed is a direct measure of your angle of attack regardless of your pitch attitude and regardless of your angle of ascent or descent. This is really important, so let me say this another way. As long as you are not banking the wings, jerking the controls, or flying through ice or wind shear, you can always look at the green or white arc of your airspeed indicator and know how close you are to the critical angle of attack. The airspeed indicator is an accurate measure of your angle of attack regardless of your altitude, regardless of your pitch attitude, regardless of your power setting, and it reads true when you are climbing, descending, or holding altitude. And finally, fact three, which is key to understanding why skidded turns are so dangerous. Entering a descent increases your angle of attack if you do not pitch down to match the changing angle of your flight path. Now we have enough background information to understand why a skidding turn can cause a pilot to pull himself into a stall. Typically, a skidded turn happens because a pilot needs to turn quickly and he is operating under the erroneous and dangerous notion that adding more rudder than is necessary to maintain coordination will make a tighter turn. For instance, if there is a strong tailwind on the base leg of the base to final turn, the pilot may likely find himself overshooting the runway. In this situation, a go-round is always the best choice, but if you must make a tight turn, perhaps to avoid an obstacle, 
then increasing bank angle while using just enough rudder to maintain coordination is much better than skidding your turn. This is because the airplane is much less likely to stall to begin with, and if it does stall, then it will not spin, so recovery can be affected immediately with minimal loss of altitude simply by getting the control yoke forward. Let's dissect the skidded turn now. We will start out with a normal coordinated turn at a 45 degree bank angle with flaps retracted for cruising flight. The end of the green arc will no longer mark your critical angle of attack because of the bank angle. But it is possible to figure out in advance what higher airspeed marks the critical angle of attack when banked at 45 degrees, and with that knowledge you can maintain a safe margin of airspeed above stall. Let's do the math real quick. I will slow it down and explain the details in another video. Also, you can freeze the video at any point so that you can follow along. The important thing to remember is that you must convert your indicated airspeed to calibrated airspeed before making the calculation, and then convert the result back to indicated airspeed for use in your airplane. 50 knots is the airspeed found at the end of the green arc for this airplane. The first step is to convert this indicated airspeed from knots to miles per hour, so that we can then convert the indicated airspeed to calibrated airspeed using the table below which has been provided by the manufacturer and which takes input and returns values in units of miles per hour. 50 knots is equal to 57.5 miles per hour. Let's round this up to 58 miles per hour for a small margin of safety. Now we interpolate between the values marked below and estimate that the calibrated airspeed that corresponds to 58 miles per hour indicated airspeed is 64 miles per hour calibrated airspeed. Next, we plug 64 miles per hour and 45 degrees into the following formula. Here the values 45 degrees and 64 miles per hour have been inserted into the formula. We do the calculation on a scientific calculator and discover that at a bank angle of 45 degrees, the airplane will stall at 76 miles per hour calibrated airspeed. Now we need to convert this calibrated airspeed back to indicated airspeed using the table below. By interpolating between the marked values, we estimate that 76 miles per hour calibrated airspeed converts to 74 miles per hour of indicated airspeed. 74 miles per hour indicated airspeed converts to 64.3 knots indicated airspeed, which we will round up to 65 knots. So at a 45 degree angle of bank, we can expect to stall near 65 knots as seen on our airspeed indicator. We don't want to be anywhere near stall speed during the turn, so for this reason we will maintain an airspeed of 75 knots as we are turning for a 10 knot margin of safety. Let's start by making observations about our condition in this normal turn. The bank angle is 45 degrees and we are turning to the left. Power is set so that the prop is turning at 2,250 RPM. The ball is centered in the inclinometer. That's how we know we are coordinated, which is to say that our nose and tail are lined up with our circular flight path. The airplane is holding altitude as seen on the altimeter and vertical speed indicators. Notice that the stall warning indicator is not on, so we know that we are not flying near the critical angle of attack. Airspeed is constant at 75 knots. And when we expose the flight path and pull back from the outside, we can see that we have entered the turn here and are currently flying circles at a relatively constant altitude up here. Notice that the nose is level with the horizon. Now let's start skidding the turn and watch what happens to the nose of the airplane as we continue to view it against the horizon. We will apply pressure to the left rudder pedal causing full deflection of the rudder. Now look at what's happening to the horizon, or more correctly, look at what's happening to the nose of the airplane. The airplane is now pointing at the ground. This is partially because the plane is pitched down, but because the airplane is banked as the skid is initiated, the nose has also been yawed toward the ground. This combination of pitch and yaw towards the ground, combined with the vertical descent, creates an almost irresistible and deadly urge in a surprised pilot to pull back on the yoke. This of course causes a stall and spin. But we were expecting this, so we will leave the yoke forward and maintain our airspeed, and along with it, a sufficiently small angle of attack to avoid stall. Good thing we are leaving the control yoke in place because the skid is causing serious loss of altitude, which has increased our angle of attack so much that the stall warning light is now on. 
We are already very close to the critical angle of attack, and the only change we made was to apply significantly more rudder than was needed to maintain coordination. Now remember, we went to a lot of trouble to calculate that 75 knots was a safe margin above stall speed when banked at 45 degrees. Well, we are flying at 75 knots now with a bank angle of 45 degrees, but the stall warning light is on. So we must conclude that our stall speed calculations are only valid when coordinated, and when skidding our turns, the calculations grossly underestimate the airspeed required to maintain flight. Let's see what all this looks like from outside the aircraft. We apply bottom rudder here to start the skid and immediately find ourselves in a nose low attitude as we start to lose altitude. We have installed yet because we understood our situation and resisted the urge to pull back on the control yoke. So we can still stop this simply by applying enough right rudder to coordinate the airplane. This would give us the same stable turn we had before. We're not in any real trouble yet, and we can stay out of trouble until we get near the ground, as long as we maintain our airspeed and angle of attack, which is the same thing as saying, as long as we don't pull back on the control yoke. By the way, this is definitely not the correct way to perform an emergency descent. Your FAA certified flight instructor can teach you the safest way to do that procedure in your particular airplane. We are starting to get close to the ground, and now I would say we are officially in trouble. We can't lose any more altitude or we will hit the ground, so we had better stop skidding this turn and fly coordinated right now. If we did only this by applying right rudder until the ball and clinometer was centered, then the airplane would immediately hold its altitude as before and we could simply continue the turn until we were pointed at the lake, at which time we would fly away from the terrain. But we got into this trouble in the first place because we thought that a skidded turn would be tighter than a normal turn and that would seem to be true if we looked at our flight path from the top. But when seen from the side or from inside the airplane, we understand immediately that this is a very dangerous way to achieve a tight turn. So in order to demonstrate how to safely fly the tightest possible turn and without losing any altitude, we will create another emergency by reversing the direction of the turn, which will bring us near rising terrain. As we start to reverse the direction of the turn, we will apply just enough right rudder to maintain coordination as seen on the ball and clinometer. This alone should stop our descent. We will also add full power. This won't make us go any faster as it would in a car, but rather it will increase our altitude or at least slow our descent. Any altitude that we can get right now will be extra helpful because the terrain ahead of us is rising. We need to turn hard immediately to avoid hitting the mountainside ahead. The tightest possible turn is achieved by banking at the maximum bank angle we can have without stalling. Remember that stall speed increases as bank angle increases, and a good pilot has calculated in advance and committed to memory the stall speeds for the various bank angles. Right now our airspeed is 79 knots, and we can't get any more airspeed without lowering the nose to reduce our angle of attack, and pitching down won't be an option until the airplane starts to climb. So we are stuck with our current airspeed. The greatest bank angle we can have in this airplane at an airspeed of 79 knots without stalling is 60 degrees. We are simultaneously coordinating our flight path with right rudder, banking the wings to 60 degrees with right aileron, and adding full power. This high power maneuver is drawing more power than our engine can produce and we can't make up the difference by spending altitude energy, so our airspeed energy reserve will diminish as we continue the turn. Remembering that our airplane will stall when airspeed drops below 78 knots at 60 degrees of bank, we gradually reduce bank angle so as to ensure our stall speed remains below our diminishing airspeed. Look at the turn we just made. It's every bit as tight as the skidding turn, but we didn't lose an inch of altitude, and we didn't expose ourselves to the danger of spinning in the event that stall occurs. So while it's best to avoid at all costs, situations where tight turns are required, if you must turn hard and you cannot accept a loss of altitude, then stay coordinated, add power, increase bank angle until your rising stall speed starts to approach your airspeed and then reduce bank angle again if your airspeed decays so as to ensure that your stall speed always remains lower than your current airspeed but please don't under any circumstances skid your turns let's review the life-saving facts that were covered in this video presentation one a skidding turn causes an enormous loss of altitude and causes the nose to pitch down Seeing this may make an inexperienced pilot pull back on the yoke to cause a stall. To make matters worse, 
The nose also yaws toward the ground in a skidded turn, making the urge to pull back almost irresistible for even the most experienced pilots. 3. The relative wind is always opposite the direction of your flight path. 4. The angle of attack is the angle at which the relative wind strikes the cord line of your wings. 5. The critical angle of attack is the angle of attack at which the wings fail to produce lift. Generally speaking, this is around 18 degrees for most airplanes. 6. An airplane will always stall at the exact same angle of attack. 7. Entering descending flight causes the relative wind to strike the wing more from below, which increases the angle of attack unless the pilot is willing to pitch down to match the changing angle of descent. 8. The loss of altitude that comes with the skidded turn increases the angle of attack, which makes stall more likely because of closer proximity to the critical angle of attack. For this reason, stall speed calculations for various bank angles are only valid for coordinated flight and grossly underestimate the airspeed required to maintain flight in the skidded condition. 9. And in the event of stall, a skidded turn will make an airplane spin, which is almost impossible to recover from when you are near the ground. 10. Pitch attitude is in no way a direct measure of your angle of attack, and pitch attitude alone cannot tell you if your wings are near the critical angle of attack. 11. With wings rolled level, the green arc on your airspeed indicator or the white arc when flaps are extended tell you at what airspeed your wings will exceed the critical angle of attack and stall. 12. Stall speed can be calculated for all angles of bank and a good pilot does these calculations and commits the results to memory. Please remember that these calculations are valid only for coordinated flight. 13. The rudder is not used for turning the airplane. Ailerons do that by banking the wings. The rudder is used only to maintain coordinated flight, which means keeping the nose and tail in line with the flight path as indicated by the ball and clinometer. 14. The control yoke elevator combination is not used to control altitude as you might see in the movies. Power does that. The control yoke elevator combination is rather used to control airspeed and angle of attack. 15. Pushing the control yoke forward increases airspeed and decreases the angle of attack, which moves the wings away from a stalled condition. 16. Pulling the control yoke back reduces airspeed and increases angle of attack, which brings the wings closer to a stalled condition. 17. Except for wind shear and icing conditions, it is nearly impossible to stall an airplane unless the pilot, the autopilot, or the trim tab is pulling back on the yoke, and it's almost always the pilot. I'd like to thank you for watching this video, and I wish you a long life full of safe and happy flights. If you feel this video can contribute to the safety and well-being of the people in your circles, then please share it by email, linking it to your web page, by posting about it on your favorite social network, and by giving it a thumbs up. Thanks again for watching.